Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 1270 in the name of Claire Hockey on the sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct inquiry. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Claire Hockey to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public, Public Appointments Committee convener. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. In opening the debate on my committee's inquiry into sexual mm -hmm. harassment and inappropriate conduct, I would like to thank everyone who came in to give oral evidence to the committee and who submitted written evidence. I would like to begin by explaining the backdrop to our work and then outline some of the committee's key findings. A little over six months ago, ago we entered into a new era. Sexual harassment in the workplace was suddenly front and centre of people's consciousness and this workplace was no exception. Recent months have seen significant changes in attitudes and it appears that society is now beginning to catch up with a long-standing issue. My committee has responsibility for the conduct of MSPs through our oversight and application mm. of the Code of Conduct for MSPs. Mindful of the Parliament's status as a role model for other workplaces in Scotland, we quickly launched an inquiry which aimed to determine whether current arrangements for dealing with sexual harassment at the Parliament were adequate and, if not, what needed to change. And I would like to thank Daniel Johnson at this point. Having raised the issue with the committee and called for an inquiry, Mr Johnson then resigned his place in the committee in the interest of promoting gender balance. We are not the only ones moving swiftly to address this issue. And our report pays tribute to the rapid response of the Parliament's corporate body in launching its telephone helpline, which provided a route for anyone affected to seek advice and support. This was rapidly followed by a sexual harassment and sexist behaviour survey of all workers at Holyrood and out in regional and constituency offices, which aimed to ascertain the scale of any problem and to gather views and ideas about how people would wish it to be tackled. The corporate body has established a joint working group to consider and agree any actions that need to be taken on a joint or individual basis between the parliament and the political parties in the light of the survey. In our report, we have asked that the joint working group reviews the evidence provided to this committee in the course of its inquiry, since it included many detailed suggestions about what a good reporting and investigation regime should look like. As part of our inquiry, we looked at the results of the survey and we were very disappointed to discover worryingly low levels of confidence in the Parliament's policies and reporting procedures. We found it unacceptable that a person affected by this type of misconduct would decide against making a complaint because of a lack of faith in the organisation's process. Getting the right complaint regime in place was clearly a matter of high priority. Presiding officer, the Parliament is a diverse working place which includes MSPs, party staff, Parliament staff, journalists and a range of contractors all sharing the same workplace. This committee's remit only extends to the conduct of MSPs and our recommendations sit alongside the work of the corporate body, political parties and any other employers with workers in the Parliament. The Parliament's mm -hmm. workplace diversity means that there is no one-size-fits-all policy to prevent and address sexual harassment in the Parliament. And this leads me to one of the key findings of the committee's inquiry. We have recommended that a central policy on sexual harassment be created to apply to all campus users, regardless of their employment status. We recommend that this central policy to be developed by the Joint Working Group should include as a starting point a zero tolerance statement and definitions and examples of which behaviours constitute sexual harassment. It's very encouraging to see that the Joint Working Group issued a zero tolerance statement earlier this week which sets out what this institution means by zero tolerance and how it will be upheld in practice. The staff survey also revealed chronic underreporting of undesirable behaviours. Indeed, the most common reported response to experiencing sexual harassment or sexist behaviour was to do nothing. While a central policy on sexual harassment ought to give people greater confidence in reporting systems, we discovered that this was not the only barrier preventing people from reporting misconduct. It appears to be the case that many individuals affected by harassment do not report it because of fears on career impact. Disturbingly, this was the reason most cited in the survey for not reporting misconduct, 
This has to change. It cannot be the case that the victims of harassment feel unable to speak out through fears about job security, promotion prospects, or other more subtle outcomes, such as being ostracised or excluded by colleagues if they make a complaint. This isn't an easy issue to tackle. We recommend that new policies on sexual harassment clearly state that the consequences for anyone reporting misconduct will be minimised and that safeguarding and protection of the person reporting misconduct is clearly set out in the policies. Staff working for MSPs are in a particularly exposed position. Their own jobs and livelihoods are on the line if the MSP who employs them is removed or if working relationships break down. The small size of MSP staff teams means that it is virtually impossible to make a complaint on a confidential basis. Our report asks that special consideration be given to finding solutions to protect staff in this vulnerable position. Perpetrators of this sort of behaviour have relied on the silence of their victims for too long. Change is coming. The Parliament's policies and processes must accelerate this change. Many of those we heard from during the inquiry called for mandatory training for all campus users as a way of encouraging culture change. I understand that the idea of mandatory, change may raise, mandatory training may raise some eyebrows. Men are generally assumed to be the perpetrators of sexual harassment. But it is important to look more closely at this. The purpose of training on sexual harassment is not only to make potential perpetrators aware of their behaviour, Training is essential for all managers so that they are in a position to support their staff in accessing support and redress. It's also important that we are all aware of where the lines are drawn when it comes to unacceptable behaviour so that we can call it out or report it when we see it. This is called bystander intervention. Finally, while the incidence of sexual harassment perpetrated by women against men appears to be lower than men against women, the survey revealed that women do harass men. It serves no one to deny or underplay this fact. While our recommendations did stop of, short of insisting that training for all staff should be mandatory, we do think there is a strong argument for all campus users in training, or including all campus users in training. In the time remaining, I would like to briefly introduce some areas which arose in the course of the committee's inquiry and which require further, more detailed scrutiny because they have far-reaching constitutional implications. And we intend to give these issues more detailed scrutiny in the future, and this debate will help inform our considerations. The first of, of these ideas is an independent body or figure be established to provide a single reporting, support and advocacy point of contact, with the possibility also of having responsibility for sanctioning MSPs. We recognise that there are practical, legal and constitutional issues which would need to be addressed before such a function could be established, but found the concept worthy of further consideration. We also looked at the possibility of an ultimate sanction for MSPs. In most workplaces, gross misconduct would result in dismissal, but elected members can only be removed from office in a narrow set of circumstances, and we concluded that the process of recall or dismissal for actions amounting to gross misconduct was worthy of exploration, and we are very mindful of the practical and constitutional implications. Finally, we looked at whether a process of suspension could be added to MSPs pending an inquiry into misconduct. We accept that the consequences of a suspension for an elected member could be more serious than for those employed in other capacities. And while we uphold the idea that MSPs should be held to the same standard, we recognise that careful thought would have to be given to such circumstances. The committee looks forward to returning to these thornier issues in more detail once we hear responses to our report, including the views expressed in this debate. I would like to finish by commending the corporate body and the joint working group on their rapid response to the issue of sexual harassment and sexual sexist behaviour. I know that a great deal of work is taking place and it's very encouraging to see outputs already emerging from their work with more promise. And with that, I commend the committee's report to the chamber and I look forward to hearing the views and I move the motion in my name on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick uh, for the Government Minister. Five minutes, please. Mr. President, officer, I propose to keep my contribution to this debate relatively short. 
The subject matter of the committee's report is of interest to everyone, but its content clearly focuses on the operation of the Parliament. The government's view on sexual harassment are already known. And like the committee, the government is keen for as many members as possible to have the opportunity to express their views on the content of the report. The government fully supports the committee inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour in the Scottish Parliament. Sexual harassment or abuse of any form, whether in the workplace, in the home or elsewhere in society, is completely reprehensible and cannot be tolerated. Everyone has the right to work and live their life free from abuse, harassment and intimidation. The Scottish Parliament should exemplify these principles, demonstrating the value of operation as a modern and inclusive organisation. Parliamentary rules and practices should be fair, sensitive and supportive of everyone. It, should be, it, it would be unacceptable for any individual to be discouraged from working in or engaging with the Scottish Parliament. The same clearly applies to the Scottish Government. The First Minister has led calls for anyone who has experienced sexual harassment to report it. In February, a new edition of the Scottish Ministerial Code included additional references to ministerial standards of conduct. The Permanent <coughs> Secretary has also reviewed and strengthened Scottish Government policies and procedures to deal with sexual harassment. Government staff are encouraged to share concerns about culture or behaviour. The Permanent Secretary has taken steps to ensure Government staff are aware of and understand the sources of support which are available to them, including a confidential sounding board. A wider review of our Fairness at Work policies is also ongoing. This will include revising the government's standards of behaviour in the workplace and considering what support is needed for leaders, managers and individuals to help them understand and ensure these standards are applied in their context. I welcome the approach that the committee has taken to conducting its inquiry. Um, the remit highlights the many factors that uh, require careful consideration. Firstly, the need to assess the current frameworks concerning the conduct of MSPs in the context of sexual harassment and the committee report um, has already flagged potential changes to the MSP code of conduct in order to reflect the need for these very personal matters to be handled with due sensitivity. Secondly, um, recognition of the role of political parties and the way in which they handle allegations of misconduct made against their members. And thirdly, the need to consider the culture and societal dimension. The report notes that remedial activity goes beyond the boundary of parliamentary standards. It extends to the behaviours encouraged and expected of those working within the parliamentary campus and the way in which the parliament operates on a daily basis. That brings me um, to the responsibilities of the Scottish, that brings me to the responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament corporate body. The Parliament has already made moves um, to improve the gender balance of the SPCB and that's a, I think a welcome first step on, and one that should be beneficial to the shaping of future reforms. The report seeks to inform the ongoing work of the Parliament's joint working group and the Scottish Government supports its recommendations. I also note and welcome that earlier this week the joint working group published a statement on zero tolerance. Um, together with an indication of other activities it proposes to implement in the future. The government endorses the constructive approach, approach to such important issues. Presiding officer, the debate allows, this debate allows for the gathering of views of the committee and parliament um, as the committee and parliament continue to take the inquiry forward. The government will work with you and all parties to achieve a consensual outcome as to how best to take this this parliament to a zero to make this parliament a zero tolerance workplace and i look forward to hearing the views of other members during the debate thank you, thank you, very, thank you very much minister and i'll call on jamie halker johnson to open for the conservatives mr halker johnson please thank you very much deputy presiding officer um, following on from our convener claire hockey i'd like to uh, welcome the committee's work on this important subject and the spirit in which my fellow members uh, have approached our inquiry the committee received a significant body of evidence and I'd also extend my thanks to the clerking team uh, and all those who wrote to us and attended evidence sessions uh, and all those who helped put um, this report together. The Scottish Parliament is an unusual workplace. Uh, within the walls of this building, 
We have 129 separate but linked employers, hundreds of em employed through different teams within the corporate body, thousands of other individuals who come through the, pit, the parliament on business every year, as well as other visitors and constituents. When the constituency and regional offices are factored in, the work of the parliament stretches the length and breadth of the country. From the beginning of our inquiry, the influence of stories in the press was clear. Against this background, it was important but that the corporate body moved quickly, establishing the joint working group to ensure trust and confidence in the Parliament's uh, institutions. It is also welcome that it established the Sexual Harassment and Sexist Behaviour Survey, which has uh, provided the committee with an evidence base which we could structure our deliberations. The findings of the survey were significant. Based on a 62% response rate, a fifth of staff members reported experienced inappropriate behaviour rising to 30% amongst women. We've heard it repeatedly said that the Scottish Parliament should aspire to be a model for other workplaces in Scotland. But when it comes to tackling inspiration and uh, sorry, tackling inappropriate behaviour, we have sadly fallen short of that in the past. Early in the inquiry, the committee recognised that there, was a there were few shortcuts here. Other legislators, both within the UK and abroad, are wrestling with similar questions and have seen similar problems arise. There's been no perfect example for this parliament to replicate, although there has been some useful learning from elsewhere. Despite its distinctiveness, the parliament does share some similar challenges with other employers. We've heard, for example, from a number of organizations about the barriers employees experience in reporting inappropriate conduct. The regrettable conclusion is that in virtually all sectors, a majority of inappropriate behavior in the workplace goes unreported. While tackling barriers common to all workplaces, we must not ignore the additional problems that the structures of this parliament can create. So it was welcome that the committee agreed on a point of principle that MSP should not be seen as having any form of unequal protection from answering accusations made against them. We've seen from the survey that in 45% of cases, individuals reported an MSP as being responsible for inappropriate behavior directed at them. This compares to 40% where a member of the parliamentary staff was perceived as responsible and 20% for MSP staff. Given the relative numbers in each category, this should concern all of us. How we ensure that complaints are reported and heard is of, key, of course key to the work of this inquiry. Our findings were that there had been a lack of confidence in the Parliament's policies and reporting procedures that require, requires urgent work. The committee has been clear that no one should be deterred from making a complaint because the structures that we have in place make it complicated or challenging for their complaint to be heard. As a result, We've proposed a single complaint route for employees who are victims of inappropriate behaviour. We want to see an existing, so we want to see existing institutional barriers to reporting improper conduct broken down. The committee recommends that this should be achieved through the means of an independent body, and have left open the further question of that body having some role in sanctioning such conduct. We'll be looking to the joint working group to consider and agree steps before the Parliament considers the matter again. And the question of sanction remains a significant one for the Parliament as a whole. The committee has recognised the limitations of the sanctions that can be taken against MSPs who are found to have behaved imp improperly, short of depending on the criminal justice system. Additional sanctions that have been ref have reflected on in the report would be significant innovations to the accountability of members of this Parliament. It is rightly a question, not just for the committee, but for the Parliament as a whole, whether they are considered. There are also areas for polit political parties represented in this chamber to consider. We were told that a fear of negative impact on their careers is a key reason given by staff not to pursue complaints. This leaves MSP staff in particular with a level of, level of vulnerability in the workplace. Our recommendations set out the need for joint work between parties and the corporate body, and we have suggested looking towards having mechanisms in, mechanisms in place to deploy staff where relationships have broken down with their MSP employer or where an MSP has left office over their conduct. The committee has also welcomed the joint working group's consideration of the culture of the parliament as a workplace. This building is, after all, one of Scotland's largest employment sites. Driving cultural change is one way of ensuring that prevention, rather than simply remedial action, can be at the heart of the changes we make in the future. The provision of effective staff training on harassment and inappropriate behavior is just one way that we can make a difference. Presiding officer, the committee's work and the conclusions in our report are in many ways an interim step. I've covered some of the many bodies that are involved in how, beha how behavior in this building is regulated and how complaints are heard. 
It's important, therefore, that all organizations with this mix take account of the findings and work of the joint working group. This parliament has a responsibility to the people who work here. No one should be the victim of harassment or inappropriate behavior in the workplace. And no one employed in this building should feel that they cannot report improper behavior directed at them. To make these changes a reality, this parliament needs to change. Thank you very much, Mr. Halker Johnson. I call on Rhoda Grant to open for Labour. Ms. Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I also advise the Chamber that I'm a member of the Joint Working Group on Sexual Harassment? And I would also wish to put on record my thanks to the officers that are working on that group and to Emma Rich from Engender, who um, is supporting and giving advice to the group. Initially, I was disappointed with the committee report um, because I expected to see some leadership from it. It feels to me like an interim report to instigate a debate that might shine a light on the more difficult issues rather than a finished piece of work. Many of the recommendations are referring issues back to the joint working group, and I'm sure we'll take on these challenges and work with them. However, we need to recognise that this is not an ordinary workplace. We have within the administration of the Parliament a workplace with normal hierarchies. However, MSPs are elected by the people and only answer to them every five years. MSPs also employ their own staff and there is no parliamentary or party locus on the management of that staff. Just because someone is a good politician and able to win votes, that doesn't mean that they are a good manager. Any HR issue could be pro problematic, but especially with something as sensitive as sexual harassment. If a member of MSP staff is being se sexually harassed by their employer, they have nowhere to turn. To make a complaint to their employer is impossible if that employer is already abusing the balance of power in their relationship. If they make a complaint to their MSP's party, again, there is no course for them um, of, and no alternative employment, only a disciplinary process for their employer. People need to work, and because there is no alternative employment available, people will keep quiet. And when it becomes too bad, they'll try and find another job. We're talking about people's livelihoods, and few people are financially secure enough to risk that. I was therefore disappointed that the Standards, Standards and Procedures Committee didn't look to make recommendations on these issues. We need to look at how an MSP can be brought to book for unacceptable behaviour. And I know that this is challenging and there has to be checks and balances in any system to ensure that it's not abused for party advantage. However, it's untenable that there is not a system that can hold MSPs to account and address unacceptable behaviour. That simply cannot be left to a party because when these allegations are made, normal practice would be to suspend the member from the party pending investigations, but they cannot be suspended from the parliament. Therefore, we need a system that can remove an MSP in extreme circumstances from the parliament. And currently this can only happen if they're given a custodial sentence. Any system would need to be balanced with our democracy. The people elect a representative and therefore they would need to have a role in deselecting that person. Somewhere between the MSP and the, and the electorate, there needs to be an investigatory process that would be above party politics and that cannot be used as a vendetta, a process that the electorate can trust and that they can use as their basis for decision making. Sadly, the committee shied away from this, and I believe that this is a decision that needs to be made by politicians. We are all vulnerable to personal attack, and while the public don't believe we have reputations to protect, we all know that rep reputational damage can be devastating. Therefore, we need a system that protects elected members from spurious attack while holding them to account when they do wrong. We also need a system to support our staff. Within the parliament itself, staff can be moved around, offered diff a different workplace when an investigation is ongoing if the perpetrator is not suspended. This can't happen with MSP staff if the offender is their boss. The MSP can be suspended from their party pending investigation, but they can't be suspended from the parliament, and therefore the staff member is likely to have to continue to work with them. It's likely that the stress of that would lead to long-term sick leave, but again, that's not acceptable treatment of a victim. We need a mechanism whereby staff can be transferred to another employer if a problem occurs. 
Worry for their livelihood should not be the driving factor in their decision about whether or not to make a complaint. Being abused should not spell the end of a career and we need to protect people that are often the first point of contact for our constituents. Added to that, we need to encourage all staff to join a trade union, to have an organisation behind them that will support and guide them if they're subject to abuse. Within parties, we also have responsibility and need to use that to protect staff. We need to understand that party structures can also bring their own issues, feelings of loyalty and allegiance, and therefore feelings of betrayal because of reporting one of their own may put MSP staff off making formal complaints about members of their own party. And this together with worries that they will be excluded, not only from parliamentary working, but also from local party events and campaigns out with the parliament. These things have to be taken into account when creating reporting frameworks in here. Between us, we need to reassure them that their complaints will be taken seriously and that we will do everything in our power to protect them. I believe the working group can now go and look at these issues and indeed the many more that we're currently working on to change the culture and to build a zero tolerance approach to harassment in this parliament. Thank you very much. I now call Willie Rennie to open to Liberal Democrats. Mr Rennie. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, this has been quite an instructive debate uh, so far. I think we've had some, some wise contributions from, from all sides because it is a very difficult subject, trying to change the culture um, of the conduct in this parliament. And I have to say, there was a degree of complacency in the early days of this. When we initially heard about the problems at Westminster, we thought we were above all that. And I think the survey clearly showed that we're not, that there are significant problems here. The fact that one in five um, discovered that they had witnessed or experienced a problem, and one in three women had. And the fact that 45% of those cases came from MSPs. I think that shows that we've got as much of a problem as other institutions have, and therefore we've got an equal responsibility and duty to try and resolve these issues. Now, I don't doubt that these are difficult and challenging things. We are a kind of an odd workplace where we have 129 plus employees um, and we all have our own standards and ways of working. And it shouldn't be the case where those members of parliament are above everyone else. That should not happen. Um, but what we do need to have is a recognition that being unable to police ourselves is no longer something that we can tolerate. We cannot have the case where and I'm not going to name the individual cases, but we cannot have repeated cases of MSPs, frankly, embarrassing this place, but also causing consi considerable degree of uh, disrepute into the parliament. Therefore, I think we have to have some kind of mechanism for change. Now, we have, they have introduced a mechanism for recall at Westminster, and I, I recognise that in this particular circumstances, it may not have uh, dealt with the problems that we are facing. But at least they've stepped up and come up with a mechanism with a variety of different thresholds and barriers that you need to overcome before action can be taken. And ultimately, MSPs are um, employees of the voters. Um, and ultimately, the voters should have the final say. I do fear about political motivation in, in terms of disciplining in particular MSPs in the Parliament. I do fear uh, the consequences of that. I do recognise that an independent process, an independent investigator would assist in making sure that it is above party politics. It may be fine now, but we might find in 10 years' time that that independent process isn't significantly robust enough in order to avoid party politics being, uh, certainly. Patrick Harvey. Uh, grateful to Mr Rennie for giving way. Uh, he, he'll be aware that the committee considered several of the, the arguments in relation to this uh, and concluded that in relation to any mechanism for uh, ultimate sanction, dismissal or the equivalent, we should be remembering the aims at the start of the, the report, which include encouraging reporting, providing clarity about the procedures and consistency with regard to sanctions. Has he given any further thought to how recall mechanisms could be made to achieve those objectives rather than putting them at risk? 
I do, Willie Rennie. I do, do recognise what Patrick Harvey says, and I do also want to make sure that any victims are protected as well, and subjecting them to perhaps a recall process would be one of the factors we'd have to consider. Also the fact that we do want consistency, and we do want this parliament to lead in terms of sexual harassment as well. So all of those factors are challenges. But because we are ultimately um, employees of the voters, um, we've got to have them as part of this equation as well. Now, perhaps anonymity could be a factor um, in that um, system uh, in order to protect uh, those individuals. But we can't, we'll find flaws with every system. We'll find flaws in the parliament doing it by itself. We'll find flaws in the public having a say in the process. And the problem is, if we find flaws in everything, we'll end up doing nothing. We'll be back in the same position yet again in a few years' time. So I think we need to consider, just pushing the boat out, considering some things that are perhaps outside our comfort zone. Because we have got to send a message to MSPs in future who might think they're above the law and above the kind of behaviour that other employees uh, would, expect, we would expect of them. And they think they can carry on as they have done before. So therefore, we've got to change the equation. We've got to make sure that they fear the consequences so they don't do this again, that there will be sanctions, that we can throw them out of the parliament if we have the desire to do so. So an independent process, having some kind of recall system might be the necessary process that we need to go through. But carry on as we are just now, I don't think is acceptable. What we do need to do is to change the culture. Sometimes drive, writing policies in reality, don't change a single thing. What changes things is the threat, the sanction, the possibility that you might lose your job at the end of this process. That's what we should be trying to aim for because I think the status quo is unacceptable and has got to change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or thereabouts. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, presiding officer. As a member, of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. I would like to begin by thanking my fellow committee members, both uh, current and previous, um, and also put on record my thanks to the clerks, researchers, and all of those who took time to give evidence to the committee, both um, at committee and written evidence. Um, I think it's important to state that this work does not, piece of work does not represent an end, but rather a beginning. And I, it'd been my intention to say that, but particular in, in relation to Rhoda Grant's comments, which I, I think were very well made, um, there was a balance that the committee had to strike between making recommendations and acknowledging the seriousness and gravity of this issue and the implications that some reforms could have. And that had to be balanced with a need to survey the views of all members in this, uh, in this parliament. So while the report is not published as an interim report, it can be understood as a stimulus to further conversation and debate. And the report makes clear that the committee is willing to revisit these issues in light of this debate and in light of the work of the joint working group. What the, the report does make is a series of recommendations which represent low hanging fruit policy changes that can be implemented in fairly short order. And I welcome the Joint Working Group's publication of a zero tolerance policy. And I believe that represents a start. And I think there's clearly support across the chamber for training, which as has been highlighted previously, is important not just to change cultural attitudes, but to make sure that employers, MSPs as employers, are equipped with the skills required. I think a key issue that arose was the need for a simplified reporting process. The reporting landscape is incredibly complicated, and that is something that we heard time and again on the committee. And that is as a consequence of the various relationships that exist within this parliament. There is MSP to MSP, MSP to their own member of staff, MSP to the member of staff of another MSP, MSP to the member of staff employed by the group. And that is before we consider the relationships with staff employed by the corporate body. And clearly one of the barriers to reporting currently is this complicated landscape, landscape. And I think looking for a single point of contact, a single portal and a simplified process is absolutely essential. But one of the 
the issues that arose from that was ultimately one of confidence. If someone took a case forward, could they be confident that it would result in action being taken? And that inevitably led to the question of an ultimate sanction, suspension, or recall. None of these options are without problems, but indeed none are without merit either. On the issue of recall, one of the issues that has already been touched upon is the potential for what is a very sensitive issue with issues of anonymity to become politicised and publicised. On the issue of a suspension, there's clearly, for purpose of investigation, there would be challenges there in, percept in perceptions of suspension, which a suspension in a normal employment scenario is to establish facts and to, evid and provi to provide evidence for a report. Suspension in the context of the, um, our place of work could be interpreted as a form of punishment. And on the issue of an ultimate sanction, where this um, derives from is for acts of gross misconduct which currently fall short of the threshold of criminality. And that is something that we have to explore, but there's two comments I would like to make just in closing on that issue, presiding officer of ultimate sanction. One is, this would be looking at gross misconduct and any consideration of MSPs being able to be disqualified for gross misconduct cannot look at issues of sexual harassment in isolation. It would have to consider broader areas of gross misconduct. And the second issue I would like to highlight, as I understand the current arrangements, there is parity between what disqualifies one from being a candidate and, and what disqualifies one from being an MSP, namely custodial sentence in excess of the year or insolvency. Again, we would have to investigate that because if there was a form with a, a, of um, regulations where an MSP could be dismissed for acts of gross misconduct, would we then want to prohibit people standing as candidates for Parliament who have been dismissed from workplaces for gross misconduct? So I think these are issues we have to explore. And the fi fi very final point I wish to make is, and I make this to Rhoda Grant, is this, this is not, as I said to begin, an end. It is a beginning. And I think it's very important to all members have an opportunity to contribute. And this is something I'm sure the committee will reflect upon. Thank you. Call Alexander Stewart, followed by Ian Gray. Mr Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Sexual harassment in all its forms is completely unacceptable and must not be tolerated under any circumstances. We all acknowledge that. It's the responsibility of us here in this Parliament to ensure that we set the highest standards to which others must rise. It is clear from the parliamentary survey, however, that this Parliament has fallen well short of the standards that should be expected of us. In fact, the survey makes some very worrying and sobering reading, Deputy Presiding Officer. Many people wanted to tell their story in that survey. Victims wanted to be heard. But they were terrified, it would appear, that they could jeopardise their careers by doing so. Of the thousand individuals who did respond, one in five said that they had experienced some form of sexual harassment. Women were significantly more likely to have encountered some kind of sexual harassment or sexual behaviour, with three in ten saying they had experienced this. The committee report on this topic once again gives some cause for concern. I had the privilege of being a member of the committee, uh, and I am no longer a member of the committee, but I was actively involved in some of the evidence sessions. And I thank those individuals and organisations who gave us that opportunity to hear how they were tackling this situation in their organisations and how individuals had come forward uh, and decided to tell their story. I think that was very important. What we did find was that underreporting of sexual harassment was found to be endemic and the committee noted that most common responses experienced sexual harassment or sexual behaviour was to do nothing. Was to do nothing, Deputy Presiding Officer. Individuals felt that there was no point in doing anything because they were going to be not believed or they were going to jeopardise their career or their lifestyle. This has to change. The current reporting procedure and policies are quite simply not fit for purpose. Happy to do so. John Mason. I'm interested in this point. Does he think this is a problem for all small employers? or is it a particular problem when the MSP is the employer? Alexander Stewart. I think what we have seen from evidence that is that it does happen across the piece. But I think what we found here was that our circumstances and our situation maybe made us 
a more vulnerable group because uh, individuals work closely with us uh, in this in in the environment. So we have to be very alive to what happens in this environment. It's increasingly important that victims of sexual harassment feel able to report uh, this kind of conduct. And that, as I say, Deputy Presiding Officer, was not the case. Individuals felt they weren't going to do that. Uh, the possibilities of redundancy, the possibilities of losing their career was all very much involved in the process. The report suggests that considerable amount of weight should be put on independent advisory body should be established. And I do welcome the fact if we do have an independent advisory body, that would make some difference. This would ensure that the single comp but of for individuals would be offered the opportunity for them to go forward to report misconduct. The Scottish Parliament Joint Working Group on Sexual Harassment, which will also consider actions, I believe is a good step forward. And that ensures that the Parliament and political parties can be positive. I also welcome the release that the group's zero tolerance statement earlier this week, which came from the presiding officer, the chief executive and party leaders. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, zero tolerance approach is exactly the right way for this Parliament to adopt, particularly as we see set, for example, in Scotland. And we must set that example. We must ensure that there are training. Inaction is not an option for us. We need to see an end and a change in the culture of attitude. Sexual harassment in the workplace is wrong, and we must endure and we must ensure that individuals in public life it's rooted out, and we should support everyone who does so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. Call Ian Gray to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr. Gray, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I don't flatter myself that anyone remembers my uh, leader speeches to Labour conferences back in those halcyon days. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure I remember them myself. Uh, although the First Minister did quote one back at Richard Leonard a few weeks ago, so maybe someone was listening uh, after all. But I do recall one speech uh, in which I announced to a somewhat taken aback Labour conference that I had a new woman in my life. It was Lucy, my first grandchild, then just born, now eight. And I tried to describe the world, the Scotland, I wanted Lucy to grow up in, equal, caring, prosperous, fair, safe, and how I believed that we could achieve that. And it was to the programme and policies of this parliament, of which I am so proud, that I argued we must look to deliver that for her. And I didn't say it that day explicitly, but believe you me, presiding officer, I want Lucy to live without facing sexism every day or systematic. And I want her and every woman in this country to live without fear of sexual harassment. How imperative then that we eradicate those things from this institution, which should symbolize, set the standard and shape, not just by law, but by example to the country we want to see. We rightly expect this Scottish Parliament to set an example to the nation around reason, integrity and service. And that is why the survey conducted by the SPCB is so very worrying indeed. One member of staff facing harassment is one too many. That one in five respondents and one in three women had experienced such behaviour is absolutely unacceptable. It is clear that we are falling short. Of course, what links instances of sexual harassment across workplaces and society is the power relationships that exist between people and their abuse. And my goodness, is this not a veritable palace of power relationships, both formal and informal? We have different types of employment and staff in this institution, but all are centered around the work of MSPs. Indeed, the survey highlighted that fears surrounding career progression, often within the gift of an MSP, was a key reason that victims of harassment do not feel as if they can come forward. And as we've heard already, there is the added factor of political parties having their own different systems for reporting uh, and increased media and public scrutiny regarding complaints which many victims feel may compromise their confidentiality uh, and lose uh, their right to anonymity. But it isn't just about MSP staff, of course. Staff employed to provide parliamentary services of all kinds also face an unequal dynamic with MSPs too, as well as being part of a hierarchical system of line management within the corporate body. And the survey 
clearly showed that victims of harassment lack faith that they will be taken seriously and that the process will not check the power that an elected member has. And that there is another issue, a, a, an incorrect presumption that responsibility for harassment sits solely with the perpetrator. However, sexual harassment will often not exist simply between the perpetrator and the victim, but will involve the complicity of bystanders too. So it is up to all of us to stand up, call it out and report such behaviour. It's up to all of us to call out everyday sexism, no matter how apparently trivial, not just serious harassment, because the one leads to the legitimisation of the other and they are both wrong. But Willie Rennie is right. Only a fair, consistent process with real consequences will drive that cultural change, no matter how hard that is for us. This report certainly marks progress, and there are good recommendations around trade union involvement, the call for a no-tolerance approach, all very welcome. But at the end of these procedures, victims must feel there will be no tolerance and that there will be consequences for perpetrators, regardless of their seniority. So I welcome the report. Yes, may I but ask you to conclude, right. please? We must see the concrete proposals. Thank you. Problem. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Alison Harris. Miss Adamson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, and just before I, I go to the substantive part of my speech, I want to just um, remind everyone that um, we often talk about the victims of sexual harassment only being women, women but we should recognise that it can be a man, it can be a man being harassed by a man or, or a woman being harassed by a woman and that we mustn't sort of generalise in, in some of these areas and also to recognise that for non-binary people in this we have to have, special, we have, to have recognition of, of, of the, um, the particular um, circumstances that they might find themselves in as well. But um, I do want to th thank the committee and I, I welcome the committee report. I think it's, it's been a, a, an exceptional piece of work and having served on that committee as convener, I know that they will have approached this um, in, in a, a very um, measured uh, manner. And um, both Tom Arthur and um, the convener, um, Ms Hockey, have outlined how complex the situation is and it's been mentioned that there are and many different types of relationships within um, the, the Scottish Parliament working arrangements that, that, that have um, made this quite a difficult thing and, and remind everyone that the Standards Committee is responsible for the Code of Conduct for MSPs um, and, and it has to work in conjunction with the corporate body to look at the wider implications and, and the way forward from, from what they have worked, worked on so far. Um, I, I do think that the corporate body should be um, congratulated in actioning the sexual harassment um, and sexist behaviour survey uh, and many members of Ian Gray just talked about how shocking some of the, the, the results from that have been um, and um, I think that, that, that that's a very important benchmark we'll have going forward because I know that one of the recommendations from the joint working group is that should, there should be a monitor of progress to ensure that there is cultural change and things are improving and I think that'll be a very important benchmarking exercise going forward. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues across the chamber, including Ms Grant, who have taken the time to, 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 to work in the joint working group uh, and have um, been, been committed to, to that work going forward. I think the confidential phone line that was established very, very quickly is a way forward and I, I welcome that development, um, although it is just the start of what has been described as needing to be a streamlined reporting process and I, I do welcome that, that that is one of the recommendations coming out of the report and I also welcome the, the need for um, counselling and therapy for those who are initiating or going through a complaint process and the report also mentions it uh, uses the word campus users and I think we're all, it's all incumbent on us all to remember that when we talk about the parliament we're not just talking about this building we're talking about our offices and regional offices and the wider community and that, that everything that we do uh, uh, going forward should, should be um, as equally um, valid and representative to the constituency offices as it is to the Parliament building and the workings of the Parliament itself. Um, I, I do am um, really interested in the idea of an independent body. I haven't myself come to a conclusion about what the best way forward is in terms of sanctions and I think that, that has to come from 
the joint working group of the Standards Committee and the joint working group, and I'm sure that's something that we'll debate and going forward. Um, can I just um, see I'm getting a, a note from the presiding officer to, to wind up. So um, I finally just want to talk about the education that's been um, uh, recommended and I, I know that there was a shy away from the word mandatory but um, I'm going to quote one of my great heroes I've quoted many times in this chamber Richard Feynman the uh, Nobel physicist and the father of um, uh, I'm so sorry physics. it has to be the quickest quote in <laughs> living memory because I want to get all members He's, in he said I am in, I'm smart enough to know I'm dumb and I think we all need to embrace that and take the opportunity for learning Thank, thank you very much. Alison Harris, followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Harris, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also start by thanking this Parliament for the work that it has been undertaken to eradicate sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct, not only from within the Scottish Parliament, but in workplaces right across Scotland. Sexual harassment can happen in all kinds of workplaces and at any level. The person responsible for it may be a work colleague, manager, customer, someone making deliveries, or in some way connected to your work. It is usually experienced by women and perpetrated by men, but it can also be the other way around and it may involve people of the same sex. It can be difficult to know what to do about it, especially if your job or prospects are being threatened. You may worry that you will not be taken seriously or that, uh, that complaining about the harassment has negative consequences. There may remain circumstances in which employees feel unable to raise a complaint of sexual harassment, however technology is now being used effectively to support people in a way that helps them feel safe to report it now. All employers are responsible for the health, safety and welfare at work of their employees. They are usually responsible in law for the action of their employees at work as well. As soon as employers are aware of unwanted behaviour from anyone connected with the workplace, they should take action to stop it and also to prevent it happening again. However, I do appreciate the problems that this creates when the employers are in fact the perpetrators. However, in any work environment, if you are experiencing sexual harassment, your employer should take what you say seriously, investigate it, find a solution consistent with your health and safety and welfare at work. They should deal with your complaint fairly and promptly, and they should treat it confidentially. Employers should also make sure that you are not victimised in any way for making a complaint. I read an article not so long ago, and in this article it explained how the Equality and Human Rights Commission had written to the chairs of the FTSE 100, saying it would take legal action if there was evidence of systematic failing in preventing or dealing with sexual harassment. In the wake of the Hollywood and Westminster sexual harassment scandals and the hashtag MeToo campaign, the Commission wrote again to the chairs of the FTSE 100 and other leading employers to remind them of their legal responsibility for the safety and dignity of their employees in ordinary workplaces across the country. This letter further went on to explain that if the Commission discovered evidence of systematic failings, it would consider exercising its enforcement powers this could include undertaking investigations into organisations which it suspected to be failing to take reasonable steps to protect employees. Sexual harassment is rife across all of our industries. We accept it far too easily in terms of culture that we actually live in. But accountability lies with leadership. Everyone is entitled to a workplace that is free from harassment and discrimination. As a society, we've turned a blind eye for far too long. Well, enough is enough, and now is the time to act. Culture change will not happen overnight, but I feel there is a definite shift in attitudes to being much more aware of sexual harassment, and it will now no longer be tolerated. Deputy Presiding Officer, we need as a parliament to encourage people to report, and we need mechanisms that address the significant barriers to raising issues in order to stamp out sexual harassment, not only here in this parliament, but in every employment. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. At the start of the Standards Committee report, I was struck by one sentence, as so many other people have mentioned today, and it's a sentence I wholly agree with. It says, the Scottish Parliament should aspire to be a model for other workplaces. Parliament, of course, is not immune from all types of harassment other workplaces suffer from. We know this for a fact. 
Well, we differ in one key respect from civic workplaces, and that's that if harassment is perpetrated by one of our elected members, they can't be dismissed as the final consequences of a disciplinary procedure. But where does this leave victims? It's tremendously difficult to come forward about sexual harassment, particularly when it's someone who has power over you. Even with improvements in reporting systems and procedures, in this workplace, workplace a person could come forward, could go through a process which is a tremendous strain on the most resilient of souls, tell strangers the most intimate details of your experiences and still be faced with an unsatisfactory conclusion, even if the complaint is upheld. If your complaint is against an elected member, even if that member is disciplined by their own party, even if they admit their harassment, they could still continue to be an MSP with access to constituency offices, parliamentary buildings and resources. In short, you, you likely will come into contact with your harasser. There are strict regulations, of course, on the breach of standards that would lead to a member being forced out of office, and we all know them. And maybe these looked at, need looked at again. And I think this report is the start of a wider discussion on that, but certainly no conclusion on what's a very difficult area. It's the people of our constituency who recruit us, and only they can sack us. Not a parliament, not a group of specially chosen people that sit in an independent body who have no relationship to a member's constituency. However, the parliament has a duty of care to those who work here. If a person is found to be a victim, is it right that they're forced into a situation where they can come into physical proximity of the perpetrator? Well, of course it isn't. But the idea of having a board of people that can overturn an election result is problematic, as Tom Arthur mentioned. However, I think we need to have a discussion on what additional sanctions of a perpetrator there can be and operational procedures we can put in place that could protect a victim from contact with his or her harasser. How do we do that while still giving, how we do that while still giving equal representation to that constituency or region is no small matter, but I'm glad there will on, be ongoing work in this. But as with most things, prevention is better than cure. Political parties who choose our candidates for election have the ultimate responsibility. Their procedures and vetting, their internal disciplinary mechanisms, or the lack of them, should not be Parliament's mess to clean up. All parties should have a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment, robust and comprehensive training for potential candidates and a reporting system which equals, if not betters, the very reasonable recommendations made in this report. I want to see political parties dealing with complaints in the way any well-run workplace would, not sweeping them under the carpet and not putting party reputation ahead of justice for victims. Because if they do that, they're failing the electorate who puts their trust in them and they're saddling a constituency or a region with a person who has hidden their true selves from their colleagues and their constituents. They damage our party and they damage our par parliament and they damage the reputation of those of us who conduct ourselves professionally. And sexual harassment is happening across the party divide. No party is immune. Some are dealing with it and with respect, presiding officer, some of them aren't. The rep recommendations in this report are right and proper. I agree with almost all of them, but don't leave Parliament to be the cure when the prevention is in the hands of all parties in this chamber. Thank you very much. And I now call Mike Rumble's last speaker in the open debate. We then move to closing speeches for your warning. Mr Rumble. Th thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Could I first of all say that I too believe that this is a very good report uh, by the committee and thank them for all their work on our behalf. And a standards debate should be free of partisan party politics, and I'm glad to see that this afternoon that this is the case and everybody's been giving us their individual views, and I want to do the same. Um, I should say for the members that are not aware that I was the first convener of the Standards Committee back in 1999 at the very outset of our parliament, and I was proud of the fact that I was the member in charge of the very first committee bill of the parliament setting up an independent commissioner to investigate complaints against MSPs and I and my committee worked for many months to get this right. I want to comment on the sections in the report headed san sanctions for MSPs and in independent investigators. I just want to concentrate on those two things. The committee recognizes that there is a mechanism for the removal of an MSP for a serious breach of the law which results in a prison sentence of one year or more. And in my opinion, such a conviction and sentence is quite rightly in the hands of the courts. Personally, I would like to see the removal of an MSP as a result of any length of prison sentence, I do think that the one-year barrier 
in this case is wrong. An MP imprisoned should not remain an MSP. However, in paragraph 81, the committee says, dismissal for serious offences is a feature of conventional employment arrangements, but there is no mechanism to remove an elected member from office for such misconduct. We must remember that parliamentarians in law are not employees, and that committee itself says in paragraph 85, removing an elected member without reference to the electorate cuts across the principles of democracy. And as to the issue of recall, we really must think through the practicalities here. And I must at this point, with the, and I notice with the diplomatic absence of my party leader, with the greatest of respect to him, disagree with my party leader here. I cannot possibly see how this could operate in the Scottish Parliament when we have regional members elected by proportional representation. If someone, if anyone, could explain in practical terms how we could recall regional MSPs who are elected on this basis, I'm willing to listen, but I can't see how the practicalities of it could be, could be done. On the issue of an independent investigator, which if I may say I know something about, uh, my committee at the time took a great deal of time to get this right, recognizing that it was important to have a complaint investigated independently of MSPs. I had the unfortunate task to investigate the first major complaint myself and my committee, and we knew that was wrong. Uh, an independent investigator is absolutely right, but it should not be the job of such a person to sanction anyone. That person should report their independent findings to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. They should have put that report in for further action. Uh, and that is clearly the right way to approach this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now move to closing speeches, and I call on James Kelly to close for Labour. Four minutes thereabouts, Mr Kelly. Th thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as MSPs, we all come to this chamber honoured to represent our constituents and, you know, we welcome those con constituents, school groups, um, community groups, individual constituents here to Holyrood and we, we hold up the, the building as a, a democratic institution that we're very proud of. From that point of view, the, the statistics in the sexual harassment survey were both absolutely shocking uh, and worrying. You know, the fact that 20% uh, of those surveyed had experienced either sex, sexist behaviour or sexual harassment, uh, it's just completely unacceptable in Scotland's parliament. I think also the fact that there were five times more cases involve, involving women than men indicates that in parts of this building, there's still too much of a sort of male dominant culture, you know, which has to be eradicated. And I think, you know, one of the really worrying points that Jamie Halco Johnson pointed out is that nearly half, 45% of the instances of sexual harassment involved MSPs themselves. So, you know, the parliament as an institution therefore needs to take a, a close look at itself. Uh, Added to that, I mean, the real worry is the committee brought out, brought out is there's a lack of confidence in bringing complaints forward. Um, and as Claire Hockey pointed out, that, that leads to, you know, really low uh, reporting of cases of sexual harassment or uh, uh, sexist behaviour. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. As Tom Arthur pointed out, there's a myriad of, you know, policies uh, across the parliament and individual political parties can have their own policies. I think one of the problems with political parties investigating uh, complaints is that there are all, there's always an element in political parties investigating any complaints, not just sexual harassment, that they will try to, to, to manage uh, and minimise the fallout from any complaint. And that's not good enough in this situation. Um, and therefore, we need a, a, a proper process going forward that people can have confidence in. To do that, I think a central policy, uh, which sits above and is higher uh, priority than that of political parties, I think would help. I think as the committee report also discussed, 
the, the use of an independent investigator uh, would give people more confidence. Uh, the other problem, of course, that Rhoda Grant and Gillian Martin brought out is that if people are employed by MSPs, they have a real worry in terms of bringing forward a complaint in, in relation to the effect it might have on their career. Uh, and from that point of view, I think that one of the aspects the committee discussed is that you know, could staff be reallocated to the corporate body uh, in instances where complaints are, are brought forward. And I think that uh, is a, a suggestion worthy of consideration. Uh, I think as well, in summing up, I think as well, Irene pointed out, um, you know, the status quo isn't good enough. There's a lot of work to do by the review group, and I'm glad that they've got gender involved in that. But really, there's, you know, if we're to achieve Ian Gray's ambition that his granddaughter uh, will, will grow up in a life without sexual harassment, we need to show uh, leadership as a parliament, uh, not just to eradicate it here, um, but also to provide the leadership so that the culture will change uh, in the country also, and we can rid the, the country of sexual uh, harassment and sexist behaviour. Thank you very much. And I call on Michelle Ballantyne to close to the Conservatives. Thank you, Deputy President, Presiding Officer. And can I also put on record that I am a member of the Joint Working Group and add my thanks to the clerks for the, the large amount of work they're doing behind the scenes. In order to tackle sexual harassment, we must first be able to recognise it. And Willie Rennie quite rightly identified that this is a complex problem. You start off thinking it's really simple, and as the working group have discovered, the more we discuss, the more we look at it, the more complex we realise it actually is. That is why the formation of the joint working group and the work of the committee and the publication of this report were and are so important. Acts of sexual harassment are power plays, and behaviour tends to be dominating and often humiliating. Ian Gray beautifully described it as a palace of, uh, of, sorry, a palace of power relationships. So I'm going to take that home with me and have a wee think about that. But it's, uh, it's quite a good description, I think. Um, and clearly, everyone across this chamber agrees that the levels of sexual harassment that we found in the survey are not acceptable. But worryingly, the most common response by those who experienced sexual harassment was to do nothing. And on top of this, nearly one third of respondents that had witnessed sex harassment or sexism, again, one of their most common responses was to do nothing. The Standards Committee report showed that underreporting is endemic in the majority of institutions, and this parliament is clearly no exception. But Alison Harris astutely noted that it can often be difficult to know what to do or who to turn to when you experience harassment, especially if you feel it may compromise your job prospects. This serves only to highlight why new mechanisms for reporting harassment are so important, and I hope that this will allow Parliament to begin to rectify its record. As my colleagues um, Rhoda Grant have indi indicated, the Joint Working Group has already published its Zero Tolerance Statement, and this is the beginning, I hope, of moving towards a better environment in, in terms of what we're experiencing here. The new reporting procedures that we're working on now, I hope will allow for independent confidential channels for complaints that will also balance anonymity with transparency and fairness. Because also we have to remember that it is not about the intention of an action or a comment, as this might be entirely without malicious intent. The importance of what somebody does often lies in the unintended consequences of our actions and how they are perceived by others. If the recipient feels degraded or intimidated, then the action must be taken extremely seriously to ensure it cannot happen again. But this doesn't necessarily mean persecuting the individual who perhaps didn't realise that their behaviour was having that effect. But that brings us to training, because, of course, we all need to become more aware and more alert to the feelings and perspectives of others. So training does have an extremely important role. Should it be mandatory? Well, lack of training should certainly not be an adequate defence. As Alex Stewart, Alexander Stewart stressed, this Parliament should be setting standards to which we expect others to rise. Inaction was not an option, and therefore I am glad that the Working Group and the Committee have been able to move quickly to establish new measures for the elimination of sexual harassment. 
but for a complainant to feel truly confident about reporting harassment of any sort, the individual needs to feel confident that action can and will be taken. It seems, as Jamie Halcrow-Johnson, Claire Hockey and Rhoda Grant have all, all identified, there is still a gap, particularly in how MSPs are held to account in a fair but effective way. But I take Tom Arthur's point that this report and the work that is being done should be seen as a start, an interim and not an end, because I think we still have a number of items that we're going to have to explore in more detail and look at the evidence. And, and the clash between Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie highlights this. There are things that seem simple on the surface that we should take action on, but actually when we start to get into the detail, uh, are very complicated to actually enact. But the thing to remember at the end of the day we are in positions of power, and as a, a result of that, we have a responsibility to lead by example, and I hope that over the next few months we'll show that we can do that. Thank you very much, and I call on Patrick Harvey to close the debate on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Till five o'clock, please, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to have the, the chance to do so on behalf of the committee and I'd like obviously to begin by thanking once again all of those who participated in and supported the work of the committee uh, whether with our own uh, clerking team those who gave evidence to us uh, and also I think all of us as MSPs uh, owe thanks to those members of the, the corporate body staff and some uh, parliamentary staff MSP staff who are participating in the wider work of parliament in addressing this issue. Uh, in, in the time I have available to us, I, I won't be able to respond to every issue that's been raised. There's a, a great deal of complexity in many of uh, the issues. But Michelle Ballantyne, Jamie Halcrow Johnson, Gillian Martin were amongst many members who talked about the barriers to reporting. We do need to get right the procedures for how we deal uh, with uh, incidents of sexual harassment. But if we don't challenge the barriers and overcome the barriers to reporting in the first instance, uh, then that in itself won't be enough. Gillian Martin ended that argument by saying that uh, we shouldn't leave it simply to Parliament. Political parties also have a responsibility. They do. We do as political parties. But we also have to remember uh, the, the issue of the cluttered landscape that's been described by uh, our convener, Claire Hockey, as well as Jamie Halcrow Johnson and others. Uh, the cluttered landscape of uh, employers, of potential relationships, uh, and we need to avoid the fragmentation of how any individual uh, case is dealt with. Uh, if Parliament is unable to uh, address matters uh, potentially under the, the Code of Conduct, for example, because information is held elsewhere, then we have still the problem of this cluttered landscape. And so that leads us to the argument for a central policy within Parliament uh, uh, across all the different employers. Uh, Ian Gray touched on a, a point that was extremely important in this uh, regard, that it's, it's not merely a case of having the right policies, but all of us taking responsibility. Uh, while, while I agree with those uh, who said that uh, perpetrators are not exclusively men, and of course Claire Adamson reminds us to, to, to place this in the context of a, a gender spectrum, not a gender binary, we do, as a society, need to recognize that there is a particular problem with men. Men, uh, are attitudes, behavior, sexual entitlement, and men taking responsibility or failing to uh, for dismissing, for example, what's been described elsewhere as locker room talk. And Ian Gray is absolutely right that if we don't call out and challenge behavior that we see in others around us, then we're failing to accept that kind of responsibility. Rhoda Grant uh, recognized that in, in the context of all of these, these aspects, there is a need for a, a clear system for holding MSPs to account. It's easy to say a clear system, but I think the debate that we've had today demonstrates that there are complexities in defining what a clear system can be. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the arguments around whether a recall mechanism is appropriate, and the committee has dealt with this. I, I hope uh, uh, Michelle Ballenstein described uh, my, my discussion with Willie Rennie as a clash. I hope it didn't feel like a clash, because there is a serious debate to be had about the wider arguments for a recall system and, and its place in a democratic process. The committee was clear that that was beyond the remit 
of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, beyond the remit of this particular inquiry as well. But those political arguments for a wider place of recall will no doubt be played out. Our concern, I will do in just a moment, our concern, and that is some of the external evidence that we heard during the inquiry, was whether or not that would be consistent with giving clarity to people who wish to make a complaint about how the complaint will be dealt with, uh, ensuring there is confidentiality for the people who wish to make uh, a complaint, uh, and some consistency about what sanctions would be applied. I give way. Mike Rumbles. I thank him for giving way. I am uh, quite clear in first past the post systems, a system of rec recall would be a good system. I'm, I'm just looking at the practicalities of people like yourself and myself who are regional MSPs. How could you have a system of recall with a uh, based on proportional representation? How would it be done? Patrick Harvey. I, I can't speak for the, the committee as a whole on that because the committee hasn't reached a conclusion on that. We've considered the complexity and it is one of the issues that we need to be thought about. I, I think we're also aware that if we're talking about what's been described as an ultimate sanction, something comparable to gross misconduct, just dismissal for gross misconduct in other employment settings, uh, what, we, what we need to recognize is that recall is one way of achieving that. It is not necessarily the only way of achieving that. And there is already a threshold for dismissal from office as an MSP. It currently lies with the courts. Uh, and that is another way of thinking about this problem. Presiding officer, I'm aware that time is running tight. This issue, as well as the principle that MSP should not be uh, enjoying or be seen to enjoy a higher level of protection from investigation or sanction than other people who are employed in other capacities. This was, uh, uh, along with the, the question of suspension, a set of issues that we wanted Parliament to debate to inform our future work. And I'm aware that there are those uh, including the, the person who works here, who wrote to me recently, uh, who don't feel able to report their experiences, who said that uh, an MSP uh, uh, approached uh, them in the, the parliamentary office of their employer and made graphic comments about my ex appearance, about what he was keen to do to me once I had agreed to go to a, for a drink with him off campus, acted in this way on a number of occasions. This person wrote to me and said, I discussed this situation with a colleague who'd worked for an MSP since 99 and was told to forget that it had happened and that it's just the way he is. I mentioned it, this person says, to my own employer who just raised their eyebrows and said that the MSP was well known to be a bit of a chancer with younger women. I think every single one of us, the committee and members of this parliament across the chamber would be united in saying that is the culture that we all need to take responsibility for challenging. We need to challenge the status quo, change those attitudes and those behaviors, and every single one of us take responsibility. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee will be committed to continuing this work. And as Tom Arthur said, this is by no means the end of a process, it's the beginning of one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and that concludes our debate on the sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct inquiry. We'll now move on to the next item of business. Point of order, Neil Findlay. Well, sir, today, prior to First Minister's questions, as is customary, we were asked to welcome a guest, Andrei Purabai, the Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, to this chamber. Mr uh, Purabai was a founding member of the Social National Party of Ukraine, a far-right fascist party. It based its uh, formation on Hitler's Nazis. It only accepted ethnic Ukrainians as members. It, it was a party practicing social nationalism and used Nazi symbols to promote its ideology. <coughs> Excuse me. It merged with uh, other nationalist parties to form the Svoboda Party, uh, said by the European Union to be a racist party, and he controlled uh, this far-right organisation's paramilitary wing. President officer, can you advise if someone researches and vets those who come here as guests, whether any thought has gone into providing members with information on who we are being invited to acknowledge prior to your invitation to welcome them? Have any politicians or foreign dignitaries who have sought to come to this parliament before been refused? And will you look at the processes around the invitation and reception of guests so that members of this parliament 
nor they are who they are being asked to welcome into this democratic institution. Can I thank Mr Finlay uh, for letting me know in advance that he was intending to raise a point of order. Uh, I do note the comments that uh, Mr Finlay raises and he is able to uh, pursue those matters either through his business manager. Uh, however, I would just draw the, the members' attention, other members, uh, to the fact that it is my role as presiding officer to welcome speakers, heads of government, commissioners and ambassadors to the Scottish Parliament on your behalf. Now, yes, a further point of order, Mr Finlay. President officer, that is exactly the point, that members do not know who they are being asked to acknowledge in this Parliament. And this is a very dangerous precedent to set because who knows who the next person to come through the door is. We do not have prior knowledge to who these individuals are. We do not know and cannot research their history before the moment that you ask us to welcome them into a democratic institution. So I would prefer to know the next time I am invited to welcome a racist, fascist Nazi to this parliament. I think Mr Finlay has made his point. I would stress that as far as I'm aware, I will confirm this, but as far as I'm aware, members are informed, or certainly it's, it, it's detailed in advance when we have visitors to this parliament. And I would stress that when we have a speaker representing another parliament, it is expected that we would welcome that speaker to this parliament or somebody representing that country. Now, if you don't mind, I'll move on to the final item of business, which is decision time. There is one item to be uh, voted on today. The question is that motion 12730 in the name of Clare Hockey on the sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct inquiry be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There are no further questions. That therefore uh, concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>